Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see your names and to imagine you as a presence at the Zimmerly Art Museum. Uh, I'm welcoming you all here to our presentation uh, tonight, which is uh, focused on an exhibition that I imagine few of you have seen, uh, unfortunately, the uh, Kabakov uh, Pivovarov Stories About Ourselves. Um, exhibition, which was co-curated by uh, Ksenia Nuril, Julia Tulovsky, and myself. Uh, and this is the first and perhaps the only public event uh, connected to that. Um, so I'm uh, introducing uh, you today, um, for some not the first time, surely, uh, to Professor Anne Komoroni, who is a great colleague and scholar of Soviet-era dissident uh, culture, who teaches courses on Russian modernist and Soviet literature and literary theory in the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of Toronto. Figuring among, among her many publications is her recent monograph entitled Uncensored, The Quest for Autonomy in Soviet Samizdat, which came out with R Northwestern University Press in 2015. Even more recently, her edition of Yuli Kash Kasharovsky's History of the Jewish Movement in the Soviet Union, We Are Jews Again, was published in 2017 by Syracuse University Press. And yet another extremely valuable addition to the literature is her catalog of Soviet uh, Samizdat periodicals, co-edited with uh, is it Georgi, Georgi Kuzovkin, uh, and uh, that was published by Memorial, actually, uh, in Moscow in 2018. Her focus on Samizdat has led to an extraordinary series of efforts in the digital humanities, beginning with the electronic archive publishing for the study of dissidents in Samizdat, which she launched at the University of Toronto Libraries in 2015. It continues to expand and now includes a database of Soviet Samizdat periodicals, electronic editions of Samizdat literary and art journals, illustrated timelines of dissident movements, and interviews with activists. This legacy of alternative publishing modalities is central to her current projects too, one being a comparison of neo-avant-garde poetics of the Leningrad Samizdat journal 37 and the Parisian journal Telkel. Beyond these commitments, Professor Komaroni is engaged in a study of the use of trash and discarded objects in artworks and museum exhibitions uh, and object, museum ex exhibits, uh, <clears throat> including works by Robert Rauschenberg, Tadeusz Kantor, and Ilya Ka Kabakov, as well as exhibits in Holocaust museums, which no doubt informs her lecture presented today in response to our exhibition dialogues, Ilya Kabakov and Viktor Pivavarov's stories about ourselves. The exhibition ac accompanying publication and related programs are made possible with the support of the Avenir Foundation Endowment Fund and the Dodge Charitable Trust uh, with Nancy Rule Dodge as trustee. Following today's lecture, uh, Ksenia Nuriel uh, will moderate questions from all of you, from the audience, we hope. And we very much hope you will stay for this. We wish we could all be together celebrating this event with a real rather than a virtual toast. Uh, but for now, please welcome to us, to our, our group, to the Zimmerle uh, and Camaroni. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, I'm just going to pull up my slideshow here. Um, Okay, is that visible? Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm so grateful for the invitation extended by uh, Jane Sharp, Ksenia Noriel, and Julia Tulowski, which has made it possible for me to speak with you today. The news of the exhibition dialogues featuring albums by Ilya Kabakov and Viktor Pivovarov at the Zimmerli Museum was very exciting. And it was of course disappointing that my plans to uh, visit were interrupted um, as so many plans have been um, by COVID. Um, but it's, it's wonderful to have the chance to, to talk about this and, and to look at the wonderful catalog um, and album images 
Albums were a, a foundational form of Soviet conceptualist art in the 1970s. And Kabakov and Pivovarov, who established their work with the album genre around the same time, were certainly in dialogue with one another regarding the themes and techniques of album art. The genre of the album is fascinating technically and as an artifact of unofficial artistic life in the Soviet Union at that time. It is thanks to the album's intermedial character, which Ksenia Noril has described so well, that they implicated their audience and the time in which they were encountered. Um, we know, for example, that they were read by Kabakov in informal performances for friends in his Moscow studio. Moreover, Kabakov described the shower series shown in this exhibition as the beginning of his significant unofficial career. This was work that he recognized as independent and his own already in the 60s. It has further been observed that, quote, for those who lived and worked among Moscow's unofficial circles, the album series 10 Characters had a powerful effect and an enduring influence, although the precise nature of this achievement has remained stubbornly obscure. I think we can easily sense the powerful and rather mysterious attraction of these albums from the exhibition. Their compelling power invites us to reflect on the legacy of Soviet unofficial art today, almost five decades after the albums first appeared and nearly three decades after the disappearance of the USSR. I could not hope to tease out all aspects of the mysterious charm of unofficial Soviet art albums today, but I will try to evoke some of the nuances associated with them and the exhibition series titled Dialogues by bringing to bear my study of Ilya Kabakov's work with Trash in the 1980s and after, when he developed a number of potentials found in the albums of the 1970s. What I find is that these albums, like later works, both invite and repel the gaze. They promise to reveal something while resisting our desire for gratification and meaning. This resistance is strategic and related to an effect designed by Kabakov. As he told it, the albums frustrate our attempts to read them in order to provoke a cognitive shift to a perspective for reflection outside the artwork. This shift complicates the kind of communion and communication we expect to have with the albums, but it makes possible a more open-ended dialogue about art, human desire, and history. Let me explain what I mean. Pivovarov's albums are less well known to me and it has been a pleasure to look at them again. The lonely man figure he portrayed resonates with the solitary and eccentric characters of Kabakov's album series. The representations of the inner world, the soul and everyday life, buit in Russian, seem at once elusively lyrical and analytic. The sky and empty ground against which Pivovarov sets his human figures and their architectural spaces or things create, as it seems to me, a dreamy and melancholic atmosphere reminiscent of paintings by Magritte or de Chirico. Pivovarov spoke about the emptiness of space in surrealist paintings as one important influence on Soviet conceptualist art. In the Soviet context, the life of the soul like banal everyday life, buit, had no independent value. It lacked meaning if not harnessed to the collective project and the people's heroic quest for the utopian future. But here in the lonely man's world, it's not time to build communism. It's time to have some tea. The concept of something extra, something that cannot be assimilated into the general order of things, as the soul and everyday life are not assimilated, resonates in Kabakov's albums. One of those albums, devoted to mathematical Gorsky, illustrates Gorsky's obsession with the series error. We learn from commentary in the album that Gorsky thought such an error would inaugurate a new series. This idea was reportedly related to his image of himself as an exceptionally gifted person. The disruption of numbers by what looks here like batons of bread um, seems, 
we would wonder what then that would create, a bread series? That's not what we get. Kabakov juxtaposes abstract signs, numbers, with material objects. Though the numbers are hand-drawn and colored, just like the conventional representation of bread. The figures of a flying elephant and horse above this series seem whimsically unrelated or connected to the bread merely by the same yellow color and conventional drawing style. Another series of objects defies comprehension as a series, concluding with what looks like a wadded up piece of paper, an ordinary piece of trash. For me, this piece of trash seems like what the formalists called a bearing of the device where Kabakov makes plain implications of the failure to assimilate into a series or system that are perhaps not considered by Gorsky. Trash, by disrupting the series of objects, does not inaugurate a new system. Instead, it manifests a tendency subtly afflicting all these objects, which are hard to describe and to consume visually. They fail to hold our attention. Elsewhere, Kabakov talked about shoddy objects struggling to distinguish themselves from an empty background. Considered at the level of the character, this trash might also cast doubt on Gorsky's ambition. His own theories might be viewed by others as unnecessary and expendable. Kabakov wrote extensively about trash, musar. He talked about the topic with Boris Groys, he used trash materials in his subsequent installation, 10 Characters, and in other paintings and works mounted in the 1980s and beyond. Trash is not just a symbol for what is considered expendable in society. It has a visual and material function in Kabakov's works where it repulses the eye and the mind, potentially provoking a leap in cognition, not entirely unlike that of which Gorsky dreamt. Trash negates the pure surface of art. This disruption is related for Kabakov to his polemical engagement with avant-garde predecessor Kazimir Malevich. Malevich worked with pure color fields and geometrical shapes, pointing toward the realm of the infinite beyond colors and the ring of the horizon in his suprematist art. Malevich figures in Kabakov's work as the big boss, whose uncompromising position left no room for other types of art. Suprematism offered a visual manifestation of the ideology of utopia, which excludes the possibility of further life or history. In Kabakov's shower drawings, done initially in 1961 and 1962, the human figure can be read as a corrupted composite of suprematist shapes a circle head and square torso with a triangular pelvis set atop cylinder legs. This is how Matthew Jesse Jackson read them. And if we recall Malevich's late career neo-suprematist peasants, it seems like a plausible illusion. However, Kabakov's man is not noble looking. His shapes are not pure. He is naked with rounded shoulders, looking rather hapless as he waits with arms crossed for a shower that either absurdly eludes him or envelops him briefly, only to slip away again. In another allusion to Malevich, the story in Kabakov's album, Sitting in the Closet Primakov, opens with what approximates a black square. It also ends with something like a white square after Primakov's flight. Here, as elsewhere in Kabakov's art, the color fields are not pure. The disappointing surface is broken also by text boxes. In the white panel at the end, we see a faint landscape along the lower edge. There's another resonance of shower, douche, in Russian. It sounds like dusha, soul, and in this way recalls Nikolai Gogol's novel Dead Souls, Myrtvia Dushi. This literary association is widely recognized as relevant for Kabakov's practice, and it's obviously pertinent to albums, which exist a narrative in terms of their focus on a character, their duration, and the succession of scenes, if not conventional plots, which we tend not to find. Kabakov's characters in the series 10 characters seem Gogolian. They are eccentric and grotesque rather than fully human. 
The Man in the Shower series serves as Kabakov's prototype of the Gogolian little man of the Soviet empire, whom Kabakov subsequently portrayed in myriad versions. All of these characters with their absurd dreams, their eccentric devotion to their tasks, and their failure to be realized as fully human, share a common ancestor in Gogol's Akaki Akakievich from the story, The Overcoat. And Kabakov's portrayal of them veers from the pathetically human to the strange, like Gogol's depiction of Akaki, as Boris Eichenbaum described it. Kabakov is in his own way a master of skaz, the imitation of defective verbal and visual vernaculars. Let's consider two examples of characters from the later installation series, 10 Characters. This series shared a name with the album series. The installation 10 Characters was presented abroad beginning in 1988 and the rooms of the characters fit into an overall setting of a communal apartment. Perhaps the most famous character from this series was the man who flew into space from his apartment. This character's room is dramatically staged with lots of red color appearing in political and other types of posters on the walls. The central feature is some kind of catapult contraption underneath an enormous hole in the ceiling. The man who lives here is gone after apparently shooting himself through the ceiling into space. And all that is left are his notes and the debris on the floor. His writings describe his desire to escape to flee his current life. Quote, for a long time since earliest childhood, I have been sick of, bored with its exhausting everydayness, its circular movement day after day, he writes. Another text in the installation describes the lonely inhabitant of this room based on his neighbor's stories about him. His attempt to flee from an overcrowded communal apartment is linked to his idea of the possibility of migration from the earth and the resettlement of humans all over infinite space. As we learn, the man's grand theory involved streams of upward energy, which he calculated he could catch if he launched himself up into the sky at the right moment. Although the police investigate, the man is never found. The floor is littered still with pieces of plaster and quote, all kinds of objects. That's how the debris is described. Its exact composition appears not to matter. The character's utopian ambitions fit vaguely with the history of Soviet space travel, but his project is eccentric and solitary. We don't learn anything else about him. We can't make sense of his disappearance and there's no other story to be pieced together from the writings. The scene commands attention, but the writing and the details do not satisfy our desire to understand who he was or what happened to him. What really are we seeing? We're likely to be similarly confounded by another character in the installation, the man who never threw anything away, also known as the garbage man. We do not see this character either, like all the characters, he's presented to us through the traces of his odd, obsessive utopian project, which in this case amounts to collecting, labeling, and neatly arranging all the trash he has generated or picked up in his life. The spectator sees innumerable garbage items, scraps of paper, rags, empty boxes, jars, and packaging. The items are glued on cardboard stands, they hang on the walls in bundles or are displayed in glass cases or notebooks. Everything has a label attached to it, each item numbered and cataloged. Labels describe the moments with which the items are associated. I was sewing something, or I was sharpening a pencil, or April 17th, or a telegram. The labels are too general to mean anything. The efforts to fix and describe the live moments are both all encompassing and meaningless. The objects too are individually nondescript. According to the text in the installation, the man is out when the senior tenant opens the door to the room so the water meter can be read. 
He reveals this private and odd collection to the outside gaze. Texts left by the inhabitant explain his motivation. Quote, to deprive ourselves of these paper symbols and testimonies is to deprive ourselves somewhat of our very memories. They form chains and connections in our memory, which ultimately comprise our life, the story of our life. Here too, the man's personal feeling is bound to a larger vision. Quote, the whole world, everything which surrounds me here, appears to me a boundless dump with no ends or borders, an inexhaustible, diverse sea of garbage. He goes on to say, an enormous past rises up behind these crates, vials, and sacks. All forms of packaging that were ever needed by man have not lost their shape. They did not become something dead when they were discarded. They cry out about a past life. They preserve it. The character veers into bathos and keeps going with digressions and variations on his theme for quite a while. Here, as in the case with other characters, the story of his life never resolves into something recognizable. We see the, the grandiose scale of his ambition and glimpse the intensity of his desire and the expansiveness of his collection, but we can do very little with the mass of stuff he left behind. The sea of garbage he sought to tame appears to have engulfed him via his own activity of collection. Kabakov realized this sea of trash in another installation, which he mounted first in his Moscow studio before it was exhibited abroad. In the 1984 installation, 16 ropes. The ropes were hung at eye level, 168 centimeters apart, so that they formed a horizontal surface filling the whole room. Spectators wandered among the ropes and examined the pieces of trash suspended vertically from the rope at regular interval intervals of 12 to 15 centimeters. <clears throat> a cork, the top of a can, an empty matchbox, etc. Viewers, as if submerged in a sea of trash, will likely examine these discrete labels. In this case, they contain fragments of everyday speech. Vitinka, come over this evening. I'll make crepes. Which? Short ones? Three rubles? Let's not wait for the bus. Let's walk a little bit, as well as some ruder entries. There's no coherent dialogue here and no story either. This is verbal trash, de-individualized and decontextualized everyday statements. This is the shared stuff of everyday Soviet life, buit. In his dialogue with Boris Groys, Kabakov described the mania of collecting trash as the product, quote, of our Russian imperial consciousness, to think that every separate thing is just trash and rubbish, but that all this rubbish should be accounted for and labeled. Everything, including a person, is given a number, like in a warehouse. Chaos is given order, unending chaos and trash, and at the same time, unbroken order coincide." End quote. There was something specific about the Russian or Soviet imperial consciousness, Kabakov observed, which despises the life and territory within which it operates, although it is its own, and which relentlessly tries to corral it into something valuable without, it would seem, really thinking that is possible. Sven Speaker analyzed the installation 16 ropes in terms of the archive. The question it posed as Speaker saw it was, quote, whether its strings can deliver what archives promise us, a sense of and in time. Kabakov's installation makes literal the function of the archive, Speaker claimed. Quote, archives contain paperwork that no longer circulates in the bureaucracy paperwork that has lapsed and become garbage, or a record, a trace. The crux of 16 Ropes is the way in which it provides garbage in a literal sense, from cigarette butts to wrappers, scraps of paper and railway tickets, with the archive's formal trappings, such as strings, labels, ropes, knots, and written words, all functioning to tame the trash by turning it into documents of culture and history. In speaker's reading, the installation is not specifically Russian or Soviet, 
It represents a more basic modern archival impulse, the urge to tame life itself in time. Kabakov talked about trash in his works in connection with the world he inhabited. These works conveyed, he said, quote, the special sensation, physical and mental, that everything which surrounded us living in the Soviet Union represented an enormous littered space. This image of a cluster of a cluttered, dusty, half abandoned, ownerless existence is firmly connected for me with the feeling of my homeland and with the hopeless feeling that it is impossible to get rid of the situation, that it is here forever, and that garbage and dirt are the very unique genius of our place, having taken up residence in it forever. This feeling was both personal, it was connected to his impression of being a person abandoned in this litter littered place, and metaphysical. In his dialogue with Groys about trash, Kabakov talked about identifying with his surrounding Soviet reality, and for that reason, using rubbish as his own artistic language. More than that, however, trash evoked a crucial liminal state. Kabakov discussed the moment of hesitation associated with trash. Quote, it happens that a person is standing near a rubbish pail and holding something in his hands, and he thinks, he hesitates, should I throw it away or keep it? Kabakov related this hesitation to the conceptualist principle of flickering, mirzania. At that moment, the thing hovers between existence and non-existence. It flickers, as does the consciousness of the person holding it. That person, who is like the artist, but also like an, imag an imagined character, personage, in the situation, stands at that moment like a demigod, as Kabakov describes it, deciding whether the thing will exist or be consigned to oblivion. In that moment, the person also decides something about his own fate, whether that bit of himself, a used transportation ticket, an old receipt or bottle cap associated with an experience and a memory will be retained or thrown away. Setting up the architectonics of flickering of the thing and the consciousness about it and about oneself appears to mean more for Kabakov than the specific material texture or implied memory of trash items. This makes Kabakov's use of trash different from that of an artist whose works would have been at least somewhat familiar to him. Robert Rauschenberg searched the streets and shops of Lower Manhattan for discarded items to use in his combines in the 1950s and 1960s. The work of both Kabakov and Rauschenberg invited and problematized the act of reading, and both provoked reflection on the nature of memory and the workings of the mind. In a well-known essay from 1972, Leo Steinberg wrote, quote, it seemed at times that Rauschenberg's work surface, work surface stood for the mind itself, dump, reservoir, switching center, abundant with concrete references, freely associated as in an internal monologue, the outward symbol of the mind as a running transformer of the external world, constantly ingesting incoming unprocessed data to be mapped in an overcharged field." End quote. And in her 1974 essay, Rosalind Krauss similarly characterized Rauschenberg's canvases in terms of the space of memory. She argued that an entirely original aspect of Rauschenberg's practice consisted of the fact that, unlike in a cubist collage or a collage by Kurt Schwitters, objects in Rauschenberg's composition retain their materiality. They're never entirely absorbed. We might appreciate Krauss's observation by looking at Rauschenberg's combine Charlene from 1954, which presents a heterogeneous collection of found objects and images, including a broken and flattened umbrella, a man's undershirt, various fabrics, and there's a scarf with images and lace, newspaper, a plastic mirror, and even an electric light. The items are to varying degrees covered or dripped with paint and thus partially incorporated into the composition, 
although they do not entirely lose the materiality that points to their origins outside the painting. The protruding, reflective, light generating, or otherwise idiosyncratic character of individual items emphasizes their independent materiality. While we may posit formal relations among, say, the various circular elements or the sequence of vertically positioned rectangular units, as between the colors and textures of different fabrics employed, we cannot help seeing them also as discrete and more or less enigmatic items. Krauss wrote about the syntax of items, objects and images in a Rauschenberg combine, which encourages a modality of discourse and a sense of durée that suggests the extended temporality of memory and narration, even if it does so in no recognizable language. By contrast, the trash items in a Kabakov installation represent a limit in his work at which, even as they are separated, tagged, and displayed separately, objects lose their distinguishing materiality and tend to blend into an undifferentiated sea of trash. In Kabakov's case, then, we need to account somehow for this deliberately negligible materiality of objects. Kabakov talked about the varying attitudes to objects versus spaces in art. Western artists and audiences are oriented to the object, he said, but the Soviet or Russian consciousness assumes the object is uninteresting. It is much more attuned to the demands of a space, whether of a communal apartment, school, bureaucratic office, or other environment. Kabakov aimed to create compelling environments for audiences in his installations. As a result, he said, the audience is quote, simultaneously both a victim and a viewer, who on the one hand surveys and evaluates the installation, and on the other follows these associations, recollections which arise in him. He is overcome by the intense atmosphere of the total installation. In this context, the viewer feels the demands of the space. For example, the atmosphere of a private room where some lonely and desperately ambitious character has been working intensely on a project. Naturally, the viewer tries to read the text and considers the objects to figure out what is going on, but both objects and texts systematically repel the viewer whose gaze returns to the total space, only to be thrown back toward the resistant details. This is one way the flickering attention of the audience may be provoked by Kabakov's work. The effect, this effect of the total installation shares something with the effect of albums as they were read in the Moscow studio for friends. The intermedial album contains within it two temporal modes, as Kabakov described it. One is the time of looking at each page, which Kabakov designed as a self-contained unit to be evaluated as such. The other time is the time of the sequence that unfolds, that of, for example, Primakov's journey from the closet to the heavens, or Gorsky's series. However, Kabakov drew attention to a third temporality, which is the time of the turning of the leaves of the album. This is the time controlled by the person presenting the album. An individual viewer may turn the leaves for herself, but this element of performance was important in the initial showing of the albums by Kabakov in his studio. It brought together a group audience for something like a theatrical event. Kabakov as artist was in charge of turning the leaves. He determined how regularly it would happen and how long it would go on. Kabakov thus controlled the time of the event and put the spectators into something like the situation of the characters caught up in long, apparently ceaseless and meaningless activity, during which they tried to make sense of things and redeem their experience. The first time viewer in particular would turn concentrated attention on all the elements of the album, the visual details and texts, trying to grasp a meaning which failed to materialize. Rima and Valery Gerlovin recalled that these viewings would go on for two to four hours. Kabakov gave one set of albums on gray and white paper, 
uh, what he called a crazy length of 90 to 100 pages each, so that the performance of them would be extremely long and difficult for the audience. Kabakov recalls one instance in which an audience member fell asleep and was audibly snoring. This quote unquote victimization of the audience had a purpose. Kabakov aimed to produce the moment when the audience members would have to turn their attention from where it normally goes in art into the depths of the work and the world of the story out to the time of performance and what is happening to the audience themselves. This cognitive shift to a perception of the environment and what is happening to them, as opposed to what is happening to the fictitious character or the hypnotic light coming from the depths of the white page, might be liberating. This liberating effect resonates in its structure with uh, a revelation about the Soviet environment and ideology Kabakov described himself and his group of artist friends having in the early 1970s. When they realized it was possible not simply to go where the propaganda finger pointed, but to turn one's head and look at the pointing finger. Other artists of the time portrayed Soviet ideological forms in various ways. Kabakov used his art to imitate the structure of such a totally controlled situation. He would push the patience of the audience to the limit in order to break the spell and make it possible for them also to see their experience and situation differently. If Kabakov's art in this way imitates Soviet propaganda or totalitarian control, it is certainly not limited to that context. The kind of awareness his works aim to promote might break the spell of ideology, but might also add a dimension experienced as elusiveness, alienation, or distance in time to the contemplation of the character and the world uh, seen in the work. The effect in any given encounter with one of these artworks can be hard to paraphrase, the same way longing and self-awareness can be difficult to put into words. The point is not some message about individual freedom or oppression in a totalitarian society. Kabakov has staged encounters with spectators that simultaneously intrigue and resist their sense of identification and codified habits of viewing and reading. The works draw the spectator in for some duration an investment of feeling that may then be enhanced by this flickering awareness. The spectator may feel identified with aspects of the character in the world while also alienated from it, where what is contemplated may seem distanced or elusive. This flickering of intrigue and awareness implicates us as emotional and cognitive participants in the artistic event. It also invites us to collaborate in the production of significance. If Krauss found a syntax of materials in Rauschenberg's combines, we might by analogy and with this awareness in mind, talk about a syntax of reception in Kabakov's works. This is an idea I proposed in an article on Soviet trash in Kabakov's works published this year. The syntax works at a different level of materiality. It entails perception of the encounter with the work as an event, situated in the varying cultural, social, and historical contexts of audiences over time. The materiality in this case is the materiality of the context. I believe that the restaging of characters, paintings, and installations, the anthologization of works, and the accrual of commentary over time in which Ilya and Emilia Kabakov have been actively involved lends support to the idea that the works can be analyzed as a series of staged encounters with audiences who find different sorts of meaning in them. If this is true, then more remains to be done to see how the staging and reception of these works has varied over time and across cultural and political boundaries. I wanna conclude with just a few remarks about the dialogue with audiences these works have facilitated from the 1970s until today. In their original staging in the Moscow studio, as far as I understand it from Kabakov's own recollections, 
These albums challenge the audience of unofficial artists and their friends to perceive the condition of loneliness haunting their closely knit communal life. That loneliness, a sense of being cut off from world culture, manifested in the attempts of many artists to flee towards a spiritual height or metaphysical depth in their works. Others, including Pivovarov and Kabakov, realized that it was also possible to see this Soviet life from the side and to engage with it artistically rather than fleeing from it. They hoped that working through their position and condition would create a basis for dialogue beyond their Soviet context as well as within it. Now that the Soviet world has vanished, um, and in 1982, Ronald Reagan predicted it was headed to the ash heap of history, recalling Trotsky's similar evaluation of the Mensheviks in 1917. We can consider these works in light of the fact that by 1991, the Soviet Union was no more. In the post-Soviet context, Kabakov's installations evoke memory, nostalgia, and perhaps a sense of missed opportunities. Although Svetlana Boim noted that it was hard to define precisely the object of nostalgia in Kabakov's works. Audiences project their own sense of loss, love, hope, or fear into these encounters. At the time of the retrospective exhibition of the Kabakov's work at the Tate Modern in 2017, for example, the header on a review for The Guardian claimed grandly, quote, with its harrowing echoes of repression, deprivation, and murder, the Kabakov's art is a magnificent moving monument to the millions crushed by communism, end quote. Such emotional language seems attuned to a new context for recycling Cold War fear. A photograph of the installation, not everyone will be taken into the future, accented by red light and patches of darkness, illustrated reviews, suggesting a sense of danger now recoded in the context of resurgent mutual Western and Russian suspicion. By contrast, a Russian reviewer of the show in St. Petersburg reported an unexpected return of a sense of the familiar. She recalled that when encountering these works in the early post-Soviet years, around 1992, the ironic conceptualist analyses of late Soviet style and everyday life seemed irrelevant for general Russian audiences. People were ready to shake off that old communal life in search of a bright individual future. However, by the time of the 2018 and 19 retrospective, Kabakov's work suddenly evoked more charged feelings. The albums in particular struck a nerve. She wrote, quote, the mothballs of Kabakov's closet are impossibly active still. We're all ready to hide in that closet. And the only place to fly out of it, it would seem, is into the cosmos. Perhaps albums such as Sitting in the Closet Primakov tapped into the disappointments of post-socialism, where nostalgia mixes with a new quixotic desire for unlikely escape. Matthew Jesse Jackson identified the main theme of the retrospective as failed utopias. And yet, as the Kabakov said, the elimination of utopianism is, quote, another form of utopianism. Above all, wrote Jackson, the Kabakov's art, quote, allows us to see more clearly all of the things that we have lost over the course of these years, as well as all of the things that we never could have had, concluding, learning to discern the difference between the two may be the ultimate instruction to be discovered within the art of Ilya and Emilia Kabakov. Indeed, it seems that the lyricism and melancholy, as well as the humor and self-awareness found in these extraordinary albums by Ilya Kabakov and Viktor Pivovarov continue to speak to us and invite our reflections and participation in the dialogue in new ways today. Thank you very much. Brava. Thank you, Anne. Round of a virtual round of applause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, um, I'll start us off by kind of just commenting how wonderful your talk was, really guiding us from um, kind of work to work and bringing us across time with Kabakov. I think that's why he's such an interesting, I want to say character, but I guess... <laughs> 
pun unintended, character within the history of 20th century Russian art, the history of art, because he cuts through so many uh, periods and places, right? And, and you, you don't um, explicitly say it too often, but you know, you do reference his collaboration currently with Emilia Kabakov and the way in which his work has been exhibited internationally, including the most recent um, solo retrospective that appeared both in Russia and in London. Um, I love that you brought the albums and their performative nature to the fore, because that was something that was very important to Julia, Jane, and myself in curating the show. They don't often get shown that way as um, kind of albums on an easel. They're often framed two-dimensionally on the wall, which they were in the exhibition, but we purposely created this installation that allowed for them to be on an easel, for it to be three-dimensional, for the viewer to circumnavigate them 360 degrees and to envision sort of what that performance might entail. And so I love that you brought that um, to the fore because it was a very special point in the exhibition that, again, unfortunately we can't see today, but um, we worked really hard to bring to life. So I appreciate that. Um, and so we have a couple questions coming in. Um, some, some people singing their praises that they learned so much from your talk, worlds and experiences they did not know much about before. So thank you so much for that, Anne. But we have two pretty substantial questions coming in. I'll read the first one from Anna Tropnikova. She says, uh, Dr. Komoromi, you mentioned Kabakov's remark in an interview that he claims it's a Russian Soviet, quote, imperial consciousness, end quote, that seeks to collect its own trash, catalog it, corral it into something valuable. Is this impulse actually Russian or Soviet? Do we see it reproduced in other communist regimes, for example, China? What about 1930s Germany? How might it differ from complexes with collecting trash in our own society, I assume, today, she means. Mm -hmm. so. um. Thanks so much for that question. Um, <clears throat> I, I understand Kabakov when he when he talks about this to uh, be um, really indicating that he is um, thinking about and identifying with the context in which he lives uh, at the same time that he's critiquing it. So I don't know that um, we need to to think that it is um, somehow particular to the, the Russian or Soviet um, sort of attempt to order things. Uh, I, I think we could, we could certainly compare it to uh, other, other circumstances and, and you can um, you know, speak about uh, the, um, the, the tendency to, to send actual trash to the peripheries. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the things that, one of the many <laughs> uh, things that, that Kabokov kind of evokes as he's riffing on this topic um, is the idea that there's a, a kind of uh, a, a sense of being on the margins of the world um, and maybe being forgotten there and, and being sort of pushed aside and, and the anxiety about that. So, um, you know, I don't think we, we need to think it's just Russian or Soviet. And I don't think that Kabakov is suggesting that that's the only way to understand it. But it does seem a way of indicating, this is my home. This is this is part of me. It's formed me. And I'm also critiquing it. Very interesting. I did think a lot about contemporary ecological movements in art and in, in life when reading your initial article and then hearing you talk today. Um, because again, because Kabakov is this artist whose work has spanned so many decades and he still is practicing. And um, I, you know, I, I wonder to what extent those are our concerns of his. Uh, maybe one day we'll find out. Uh, I have another question coming in from Mary Nicholas. Um, this is fascinating material. Thank you, Anne. This is a very creative reading of Kabakov. I'm especially interested in your discussion of his shoddy objects losing their materiality, but perhaps gaining in significance in a series over time. The new context you suggest is also really interesting. Um, she asks a few more questions. I'll just read them, but we can go back over them. Does Kabakov risk, however, playing with self-exoticizing? 
don't those Soviet mothballs still sell well in the West, especially as we fear our own society is in danger of disappearing too? Yeah. Hmm. Um, thank you, Mary, uh, for the, the comments and the questions. Um, you know, I think this, the exoticism of the Soviet environment and thinking of particularly staging a communal apartment, you know, in New York or in the West, um, already in the late 80s was to kind of lure audiences with a promise of this um, somewhat hidden and exotic world that they could glimpse with all these weird characters and strange things going on. Um, and and Kabakov, of course, didn't didn't want ultimately to be evaluated on the basis of you know his exotic Sovietness. Um, I think one of the really interesting things that happens as we get into the post-Soviet time and maybe the later post-Soviet time in particular is to is, is see how maybe that um, exoticism is recoded in terms of a lost world, that there kind of was this um, Soviet world and there were these dreams and now it's gone. Um, and so I, I think it's a calculated risk that Kabakov takes. And I see, I don't know whether I'm right about this, but I see the, um, the, the, the way the, the material objects and the stories kind of slip away as, uh, as kind of um, a, a way of uh, escaping from the trap of being caught in the specificity of um, a Soviet nostalgia or um, kind of align oneself with uh, the, the, the nostalgia and the hopes that, uh, that can be that are that are evoked without really being specified. I would add to that, you know, because yeah, wonderful question, Mary, too, and um, response um, that there's a degree of specularity involved in those presentations, but that they change dramatically from display context to display context. And I know you probably went to the Feldman Gallery in 86, where people were not, they were expecting something dramatic and they were rewarded with it, which is a very different thing. And so, yes, I felt that this element of self-exoticization was there, was staged for us. Uh, and that, you know, Kabakov was playing one side of the risk. But I don't know if I'm the only one who's seen the installation of the man who flew into his picture at MoMA uh, which isn't frequently up, but there, there's a very different degree of spectacularization of, of uh, the installation so that you, you, you're in, you encounter a door, you know, one of his beat up doors. And if you're a viewer who knows nothing about Kabakov, you really don't know what to expect and you don't expect what you see inside, which is, you know, not really detritus, it's a painting in a chair. Uh, and I think that works very forcefully, very effectively to at least destabilize our own sense of where we are in this gallery space. So I'm beginning to think that uh, Ilya and, and Amelia are very um, uh, yeah, cognizant. And, uh, you know, I wonder to what degree they, they are shaping that precise question, you know, mm -hmm. now. We have a couple more questions coming in through the Q&A function um, from Ethan Krauss. Dr. Komoromi, you referenced Kabakov's view on the difference between Russian and Soviet viewers focus on space versus the Western viewers focus on objects. Um, and I'll just interject, I mean, that's something that Kabakov writes a lot about in his lectures. So very good point. Do you agree with his assessment? Why or why not? And in turn, has that changed in the past 30 years with, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union and various, you know, changes in Russian, Russian context? Um, thanks for that question. Uh, also a good one. And um, yes, although Kabakov talks about that as kind of a, a binary, uh, you know, difference, I think that's sort of 
heuristic for the um, argument and the strategy that he's that he's kind of deploying. I I don't know that he or we need to think that that is is a hard and fast sort of rule. Um, I, I believe he was trying to sensitize international audiences to what he was doing with uh, spaces and the atmosphere of installations that were calculated to exert, you know, this sort of um, force on on spectators. Um, but uh, yeah, I would I would assume that we could find plenty of counterexamples um, recently. And, and I don't think that appreciating what he's doing with these um, carefully constructed spaces means that we have to take this as, as a kind of hard and fast distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, carefully constructed is, is very true. I mean, I know Jane has worked with um, Kavakov and, and I'm sure you too for, for many years. And um, he is very, very specific about how his work is executed. You know, even work that remains in museum collections that, you know, presumably have very clear directions about, you know, what color the paint should be, what color, you know, um, how, you know, bright the light bulb should be. And, um, you know, that's one of the joys of, of working with him and working with Amelia. I mean, even on this very show, how, uh, very interested they were in the catalog production, in the in the uh, hanging of the works. We talked extensively about paint colors and you know distances between various pages. And um, you know, as as a curator, as an art historian, I mean that is um, truly you know the kind of lifeblood that goes into shows um, to work with a living artist. You know, as um, as visionary as him and as, um, you know, um, steadfast in, in that vision across the decades, across the, the geographies. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was that was a really um, fun aspect of this particular show at the Zimmerly that was up until just recently. Um, we have a couple, one more question, kind of quite a long one. So I'm gonna try to read it and then we can sort of pick it apart. So many thanks again for your talk and his installation. This comes from Maria Todova, Maya Todova, excuse me, Maya Todova. In um, his installation, Red Wagon, Kabakov equates trash and rubbish with the last stage of socialism, the time of Brezhnev. In that sense, trash functions as both iconic and in, an indexical sign of late Soviet reality. Similar to other Kabakov installations, the wagon unites utopia and ugliness or dream and reality. Would you say that by cataloging trash and objects and attaching labels to the individual items, his art, installation, albums, conversational paintings, etc., attempts to construct a system that unites both binaries and articulates their coexistence, if not codependence in Soviet Russia? To what extent is this cataloging gesture directed to Western curators and audiences as opposed to Russian viewers? I think that's so well said um, about the you know bringing the putting putting those things together. Um, is it is it directed towards Western viewers rather than um, Soviet or Russian audiences? I don't know. I'd be curious to to hear more from um, from Russian audiences. I think that. Uh, even if he was thinking of those international audiences and maybe Western audiences early on, um, in the, you know, as we get further from that late Soviet time with which he identified that sort of debris and trash um, in the red wagon, uh, you know, we're all foreign audiences to that initial context of the production and initial reception of the works. So yeah, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear more from from what uh, other other spectators think about that. Um, but I think it 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 remains a very live kind of problematic conjunction of those things. Very interesting. Very interesting. So we're coming up on time and I've just reposted some of um, the links regarding the exhibition and the publication and Dr. Komoromi's bio in the chat. 
Um, so I don't know if Jane has any final words before we wrap up for the evening. Uh, well, I actually have a final question that I kind of wanted your take on um, because, and, and Ksenia, uh, it's, it's in your interview, um, which is uh, the extent to which the albums uh, respond in some way, if not are indebted to, uh, you know, this experience with illustrating books. Mm. And, and while on the one hand, I understand his desire, and, and they all say this, Bulatov and, and Vasiliev said this too, that that was a separate world of production for them, that they saw it absolutely uh, as a separate sphere of activities. And yet when you were speaking, and about this um, degree of absorption and the ambivalence that that uh, projects onto the viewer, whether to be drawn in or to um, you know, experience this as a kind of resistance. I'm, I'm put in the mind of the way in which, I don't know, storytelling or uh, book illustration works you know, for children's books. I mean, don't they create these worlds? And uh, one could say that there's a certain level of ambivalence uh, in, in one's encounters with the Brothers Grimm or whatever, whatever you happen to be illustrating. But I'm wondering what you think about that kind of response and maybe Ksenia too, you know, because he always says the same thing. He always says, absolutely not. Ksenia, maybe I'll let you uh, weigh in since you had the interview. Sure, um, I was just linking everyone to your, oh no, sorry, that's to just the panelists. I was gonna link everyone to your amazing article that um, Mary Nicholas mentioned and you mentioned in your talk. So everyone has a, a easy access to it um, and so they can enjoy it. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. There's always the artist's narrative and then there's everyone else, right? And so while I deeply value the artist narrative, I'm an artist first curator. I always turn to the artist when I can, when available, um, nearly now exclusively working with living artists. And I think, you know, there are different ways that artists remember things. And because I think Kabakov has gone through so many different periods of his life and the actual act of history writing or self-historicizing is so very important to him. He's very careful about how he says things, um, how he frames things. Um, and you know that, as you say, Jane, is a narrative that he has maintained over the years. And I respect that and I, on one hand, don't doubt that. However, you know, as a curator, as an art historian, I have my own narratives, right? And I have my own ability to assess and draw conclusions. And so in the exhibition that we, you know, co-curated and, um, you know, shared with the public for quite some time before COVID was, you know, that connection was expounded upon. Central to the show also was another case with the books, several books from both artists. And I mean, the visual correspondences cannot be denied, right? But there's also a difference between that sort of pseudomorphic visual correspondence and then actual like feeling, right? And I'm not sure maybe we'll ever know because an artist often will kind of st and stand, you know, stand up for his or her interpretation until the very end. But again, I think that's that's the work that we do. And that's the work that you know makes our lives so interesting. So um, I will say I've, I've never um, had an issue with kind of that, that maybe disagreement in interpretation, um, whether it's with Kabakov or with another artist. I think that's what makes, you know, what our, makes our work so wonderful. So I don't know, Anne, you can jump in. That was sort of a vague response, but. No, no, I think it was quite on, on point. And it seems obvious to me as an outsider that there is this um, use of the visual aesthetics of um, book illustration. And as Jane was saying, absolutely, the kind of um, provocation to absorption, which I'll call a provocation because I think it's sort of strategically set against the um, you know lack of a fully developed sort of world or very satisfying um, or, or unambivalent visual um, regime. But, uh, but I think, and one of the things I appreciated about the interview, um, Ksenia, was um, the fact that Kabakov 
said, well, you know, maybe that's for art history, not, not this question particularly, but in general, there are questions that maybe it's for art historians to, to say. Right, right. And, and he also has this, I, I find, you know, delightful way of partially identifying with his own characters so that the things he says, you can, you can sort of take them or frame them. Like mm -hmm. you don't have to think that he's pronouncing the monologic truth of what, you know, is going on. Um, and I find that, you know, to be another way that, that he kind of invites this mm -hmm. dialogue about what we think. He's very clever and he's, um, and, and he, I think, again, I'm speculating, I'm not speaking for him, but I think he revels in that dialogue that you just mentioned in, in that kind of debate. And um, when art historians write about him, I think he, I think he enjoys seeing that play out. Of course, he still has his own narrative. And I mean, he even makes works about it and, uh, you know, his own, historiography, Charles Rosenthal, Spivak, and so forth, later in life, more recently, has expounded upon that. So um, it's a very, you know, this is why it's sort of the gift that keeps on giving his work, that we can still, you know, so many years after the production of these albums, still look at them and still, you know, reconsider them. And you can still write wonderful articles um, and, uh, you know, hopefully future book uh, on your docket, Anne. Yeah, thank you. So with that, I mean, it really is the first time we've had, you know, although he is so central to what people understand about Moscow, can, you know, Moscow art, dissident art, uh, not to mention conceptualism, you know, we haven't really focused on him in our programming to date. Uh, this is our first time actually mm -hmm. uh, doing this. And so I'm especially grateful to you, Anne, for coming and, and giving us such a provocative lecture, much to think about I, as a scholar and, and curator, and I, I'm sure for the rest of the audience too. Um, well, uh, thank you so much for including me in the conversation. Well, it's really wonderful. And thank you all, all the auditors. I wish I could see you, but you know, we'll all get jabbed this year and then you'll come and we'll have drinks. Uh, and we hope Anne will come too at a Zimmerly event within the year, calendar year, I suppose, not by December, but next year. Yes, echoing thanks um, to Anne for this incredible presentation, to Jane and Julia, my co-curators, to the museum as well, um, as to our funders, the exhibition accompanying publication and related programs were made possible with the support of the Avenir Foundation Endowment Fund and the Dodge Charitable Trust, Nancy Rule Dodge Trustee. So thank you again to everyone here tonight. This um, talk was recorded, it will be posted, so please, um, Rewatch it, enjoy it, share it with your friends, and um, hope to see you at the Zimmerly as soon as it is safe. Thank you. Yes. Thank you again, and we'll be in touch. Wonderful. Take care. Bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.